that if Will Levis is in line to play this week and he does go out there, I don't think we can see any more of this conservative play call. Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast live on Friday, October the 18th. I am your host, JT Runke, writer and reporter here at Broadway Sports Media. You can follow me on Twitter at JT underscore Runke. Once again, joined on the Hot Read Happy Hour by Stoney Keeley, editor-in-chief of Sobros Network, one-third of the Football and Other F-Words podcast, and co-writer over at Stacking the Inbox, Stoney. The uh, the Titans injury report came out today, and everybody should panic. Everybody go crazy. Ooh. It's wild. Will Levis is questionable. That means that they are benching him secretly because they need Mason Rudolph for this game and, and uh, everything. No, I mean, this is an interesting uh, discussion to have, but I don't know if it's one that is very rational. But nevertheless, how are you doing, Stoney, uh, on this Friday? Pretty tired. Uh, didn't get back from Clarksville. Went up to the F and M Bank Arena to see a concert last night. I'm wearing last night's clothes. Haven't showered today. Running on five hours of sleep. But uh, I I love talking Titans. So we grind on. We get it done. Yeah, I mean, I I guess I begrudgingly like talking Titans, considering also my New York Mets are playing in the most important game of the year, an elimination game against the Dodgers, which for oh my God. Full, we got to get you out of here. I know. I mean, for full clarity and context, I, I do have it on my other monitor right here. So if I look like I'm distracted <laughs> at all today, or I, I look like I, I die at some point and you know, there, there we go. Shohei Otani doing Shohei Otani things. If that had, does happen, uh, you know, that, that is why D good in the comments. Welcome back. D good saying, Hey JT, where's he been? Mets have a comeback in them. I, you got to believe that's, you know, I'm going to keep believing until the end of this game and we'll we'll see after that, I guess. But that is a great segue into our discussion today. And if you want to join the discussion on the Tennessee Titans uh, and their quarterback situation and this upcoming game against the Buffalo Bills, do us a favor. If you're watching on Twitter or Facebook, head on over to the Broadway Sports Media or 440 Sports YouTube channel where you can join people like D. Good and Eddie here uh, in the discussion. Once again, have to give one quick shout out before we get into this discussion to Sinkers Beverages, our lovely sponsor uh, here of the Hot Read Podcast, making this content that we bring every week free to you. Thank you to Sinkers Beverages once again, who, by the way, um, I don't know if you saw this. They are now they are not just three time best of Nashville liquor store of the year. They are now four time best of Nashville liquor store of the On year. A run. As, uh the Mets already have committed two errors in the first two batters. <laughs> this is gonna be a great this is gonna be this is gonna be a great episode. I can already tell. Um I Eddie does sorry, people are gonna get com- mad in the comments of like YouTube and stuff, being like, get to get to the Titans already. Get to let me be angry about my Tennessee Titans. But Eddie is right. It's mildly hilarious the amount of Titans media that and subsequently Yankees fans. I mean, I can count right off the top of my head how many New York baseball fans there are in, in the Titans media room. I know for a fact uh Paul Kaharski and um and Terry McCormick are Yankees fans, and Paul loves to let me know that I am a loser and always will be a loser because of the uh, the Mets, which uh, you know I get. But then we do have some people at our back, you know, the owner of 440 uh, Sports, Braden Gall. Uh, he is a diehard Mets, well, diehard Mets, yeah, he's a diehard Mets fan. And then we have Teron Davenport. Uh, I think I believe Willie Donick is also a Mets fan. We got a, we got a couple people here in the building, well, so that, that I, is pretty crazy. For the record, need to state that I am a massive diehard New York Yankees fan. Myself. This is a development. That's so, right. I almost forgot. I almost yeah. forgot that you are also. I am. A, a I know. Yankees fan. Wow. I know so much about baseball. I'm such a huge fan. Diehard. Never miss a game. No, I'm I'm just kidding, everybody. I married into a Yankees family. My wife is from Monmouth County, New Jersey, and uh, everyone in her family, they're either Yankees or they're Mets fans. We've got a divide in the family between the Yankees and the Mets. But in my household, the trade I arranged whenever we um, moved in together was I will root for the Yankees in baseball if we can be a Memphis Grizzlies household. 
And my wife said, okay, that's fair. Shook hands. So we watch, we watch the Grizzlies during basketball season. We watch the Yankees during baseball season. And I honestly have no clue anything about baseball i was watching the yankees the other night with my father-in-law and i just every five minutes you just sprinkle in a man can't believe he swung at that i mean that's that's that's, well on my couch so i can't i can't blame them too much however let's let's enough with the baseball talk here that's not what the people came for the people came to uh rain from the top scream from the, the the top of their their roofs about this game because a uh, a jump scare, a s- total surprise today on the final injury report for the Titans and the Buffalo Bills. Uh, Brian Callahan confirmed earlier today the guys who will not be playing this week include Keandre Coburn, Cedric Gray, of course, who, by the way, not for nothing, that's now two of the three weeks he is designated to come back. I don't feel very I, I don't feel good <laughs> about him yeah. making a return and playing in any capacity whatsoever this season. But then also uh, Traylon Burks also not playing and is an IR candidate for sure, um, which is pretty funny because he made one catch and is now headed to IR, which I mean, Tough such scene. is the life of Traylon Burks. But that th- th- those are all pretty cut and dry. And then we have the uh, interesting development of Legereus Sneed not practicing whatsoever all week, not because of his knee, but listed as a quad injury. He's questionable to go. If you had to give, if I had to give you a read on that situation, I'd say it's probably 60, 40. He doesn't. And that's, that's not based on anything. That's just my feeling and the vibes I'm getting. And then the big one, Will Levis. He was a limited participation participant on Wednesday, full on Thursday, and then back down to limited Friday and is listed as questionable. Oh Hmm. my God. That was a double entendre there because the Mets just got out of a jam there. So uh, good for them. But I think this brings up the question and we can kind of dissect what this really means for this, uh, this Sunday. Um, First of all, do we think that this is more of a, a out for, for the coaching staff to maybe give them an opportunity for Mason Rudolph to start? Or is this saying more about the team wanting to maybe give Will Levis as much time as he needs to finally get fully right headed into this tough stretch that they're going up against? Obviously, last week, a big point of contention after the game against the Indianapolis Colts was the the kind of the, the difference between um, you know, Brian Callahan, the coach, and Will Levis on their thoughts about how uh Will Levis will how healthy Will Levis was in this game. Will Levis saying himself he uh didn't feel like he had the most strength or 100 percent strength in the world here. Um, versus Brian Callahan saying he had no reservations about anything Will Levis said in that game. Do you think that maybe this is a good step in the right direction that they are now kind of both on the same page and and things are kind of working a little bit better together? Or is this, you know, like the the tinfoil hat, is this the uh, the clever ruse here to get Mason Rudolph to get a start in a, in a game where the Titans already have their backs against a wall against this, this tough opponent? Well, JT, I think the convenient thing here is that it probably works both ways. I think they could justify it either way, and that puts them at an advantageous position as, as a coaching staff. I do think the decision to list him as questionable on this week's injury report, report, it paints last week's conversation about Will Levis's shoulder in a bit of a different light because they seemed like they were on uh, different wavelengths there talking about the injury. Will Levis saying that it, it impacted him a little bit. Brian Callahan, Nick Holtz didn't seem to have any reservations about the arm. So is it either that they just didn't know or maybe Will wasn't forthright about his injury? You know, it, it's not great either way. So the correction here, it could be. It could be as simple as, hey, man, we didn't realize your your arm, your shoulder was as, as bad as it is. We need to shut you down because we really want to get a good look at you over the course of the, the next few games. And we we don't want you risking any further injury. We're one and four. Doesn't matter anyway. Like, let's just get that thing rested. At the same time, it could be a way to say a quarterback's not playing with the utmost confidence right now. We want to bench him so that we can get a look at Mason Rudolph and see how this offensive scheme can operate. And we don't want to completely shatter the confidence of Will Levis. 
So we're not going to tell him he's benched. We're just going to put him on the injury report. So I think it's a smart move by this coaching staff because it, either of those decisions can be justified with the the logic I just presented, and they don't really have to tell us. So I I tend to think that it is just a case of playing it safe with the player, but I'm just there's there's the voice in the back of my head that just has watched the tape all season so far, and and I can't. I can't justify it when I come on this show on Tuesday and say, you know what? I, I think I'm done. I think the eval's in. I, I don't know what else there is to learn about this quarterback that could turn things around and then blame the Titans coaches when they actually decide, hey, you know what? Maybe it is time to go to a different quarterback. So I don't think it's as tinfoil hat as some people think it sounds, but I think they're in a good spot to justify it either way. No, I, I think ultimately I agree with you that it's it's very gamesmanshipy, very coach speaky yes. way of way of going about it in the correct way, right? You don't, as Brian Callahan in his first year probably doesn't want to put himself in any box, so to say. Yeah. There, Shrike in the comments saying how very Anthony Richardson of them to <laughs> well, do this, almost the similar situation from last man. week. But I do agree that you know I, I on my way home today. Um, from running some errands and whatnot, I was listening to Blaine and Zach over on 104.5 The Zone, and I think Blaine, Blaine was spitting today. Blaine, Blaine was for you was spitting. No, you you said it right there. I, I do think he brought up a very interesting point about how you know even even if Will Levis might not like the Titans justifying benching him because of this injury, that like he said, he believes that even though he's not 100, percent he's healthy enough to win as he said last week which struck a nerve with a lot of the fan base last week after that that game um i i do think there is some value to letting especially against an opponent like the next two whether the lions game is the lions game that will happen in due time when we talk about that but at least for this buffalo game against a team that just on paper top to bottom even though you have a, one of the best defenses in the league just feels like it outclasses you at almost every position right now in terms of execution. Um, it feels like giving Will Levis the week to kind of watch Mason Rudolph operate this offense, kind of let a maybe frustrated offensive scheme personnel uh, coaching core like kind of get things restarted and rebooted and give him that the second to breathe watch and come back the next week against yet another uh very difficult opponent and see if that maybe uh, maybe hinders him from making those bad mistakes that he does and maybe promotes some growth in his game however i do think that if will levis is in line to play this week and he does go out there I don't think we can see any more of this conservative play calling. I like, like we said on Tuesday, we both feel like the eval is more or less in on what Will Levis is as a quarterback quarterback, but you know, to, to his credit, he's done things in, in his first season in 2023 that gave you the flashes and hope that he could be the guy yet. We haven't really seen the opportunity for him to do that. And whether that's the, the Will Levis himself just, not being able to do that and execute this year, or whether it's the different scheme that he's running. We've seen it happen in the past, even if it was a mismatch advantage for the Titans. At this point, when you are one and four in the season, and if you are going to put Will Levis out there, I'm at the point where you just have to let him loose, man. You just got to sling it in, in what happens, what happens. Like he's already leading the league in interceptions. He's already leading the league in turnovers. And it's basically on, on the, the, conservative play calling that you already are trying to hinder him to like at this point if we're going to see this this discussion here uh for will levis like i we're, we're at the point in my opinion that you just kind of have to let him sling it yeah i uh i agree with you in theory jt and it's something that i've said for the last couple of weeks like just go out there just call the place just just do what you want and the full extent of the vision of this offense to be just just let it rip so to speak but I did, over the last couple of days, I did have a sort of darkest timeline thought creep into my head, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on it, because it really feels like 
throughout the media availabilities this week between Brian Callahan and Nick Holtz, it, it feels like there's a little frustration uh, boiling up in the coaching staff, and I'm sure it is in the entire locker room. Everybody is frustrated with losing. I get that. But it kind of feels like a little bit of like constipation on offense. Like they got to take a laxative and just let the shit out kind of deal. What if in this darkest timeline scenario, what if they have been calling the offense like the full extent of the vision for this thing? What if they have been getting the play calls in and they have been letting it rip from the uh, from the clipboard, so to speak, but it's just not being executed by the quarterback? What then? What then, JT? What what more is there for the staff to do if that's the case? If we entertain that idea just for a little bit. I I mean, you're not entirely wrong in that thinking because I believe there is a little bit of truth to that. And that's kind of the frustration we've seen from this coaching staff and a uh, coaching staff that has been relatively frank with telling us up front yeah. that they they have whether it is telling us specifically or in their body language or in the way they've been answering a lot of our questions in the media room you just you're starting to feel that frustration um as oh my god let's let's go pete pete alonso baby <laughs> sorry i uh, <laughs> that that's crazy let's go um you're starting to see the frustration here for the titans coaching staff and i think it really started this week when Brian Callahan kind of came into his, his Monday press conference, seemingly not having a lot of answers to well, why things aren't working and seeing that frustration on his face. And then we get to Nick Holtz this week um, at his uh, press availability. And it, you also kind of see the frustration um, that is rising, but I think where it may not be, the case for you is that I think that they recognize that this may be a possibility and already trying to make rather drastic changes to address it. And what I mean by that is yesterday, Nick Holtz had a very interesting insight on uh, his, you know, how, how they approach the, the post game film review for the offense. Mm -hmm. And this is what he had to say yesterday on the issue, which I thought was pretty interesting. Like there's, we watched all passes, we watched all the plays as a group, but we sat down the whole team or the whole offense and watched all the passes on Monday. And we went and went through as a group, line was in there, everybody, okay, where should, where does everybody think the ball should go here? Where should the protection be? And just so that everybody was on sync here in the same voice at one time, we kind of silo some things out, you know, the line goes in their own corner and things like that. So we thought Monday was kind of a chance for us to, okay, we. Whatever happened yesterday, this happened. Let's take a breath. Let's look at it holistically as a group with the players and say, does anybody think the ball should go here? Okay, yes. And kind of walk them all through it that way. And it was a good chance for us to kind of reset, I think, a little bit. That so I thought that was an interesting answer. It, it's something that, you know, whether it may not be the best answer that or the answer you want to hear for your team saying, let's have a Q&A session, like, a, like an exam review look at the film and say, should he throw it to A or B? And then half the class is scared to raise their hand because they think it's B and the other classes, half the class is scared to raise for A. So you just start seeing everybody slowly raise their hand and the majority just piles in and then you wait for the teacher to give you your answer. It doesn't sound great, but it seems like the frustration that we see, they see as well. And they're trying to get this team that we say continues to not be able to click very well to be on the same page and finally be able to click because it seems like they have not been on the same page. And I mean, it, it, I, I think it is interesting what going back to what you said about, you know, Will Levis's inability or, or if they are calling it um, maybe the full extent of it in that darkest timeline. I mean, I, I do think that there may be some, you know, I, there may be some truth to that. However, at the same time, you kind of just go back and you look at the next gen stat passing charts and you kind of look at what Will Levis has been able to do as a quarterback. And it, it, I, I just don't really buy it to the full extent. You, you can go back and look uh, in front of the show. Zach Lyons brings up some interesting points here where Will Levis through week six stats when he's going. 
going on deep passes, which are 20 plus air yards. Uh, his throw percentage is, you know, it is the 10th highest 11.2%. And the completion percent is 27th in the league here, uh, 21.4%. But if you look at where they really haven't been able to get Will Levis to throw the ball, which is the middle of the field where, you know, maybe he's had some more trouble in getting more of those interceptions. His throw percentage is the 14th highest at 20.8%. Completion percentage is at 27, so a whole 10 spots better at 53.8. His EPA per pass is 10th which is the best of any position where he's or any place on the field where he's throwing it. And his quarterback rating is 12th in the league. And it seems like when you look at those and consider that in, in, in terms of, okay, so maybe they've been a little bit more conservative with him, keeping it close to the vest at the line of scrimmage or just taking the top off of it because we're scared of what he can do throwing in the middle. That's where I, I think you just kind of have to kind of roll the dice and let him let him a little bit loose because we've seen when he is able to connect in the middle of the field, that's where you're finding the most success. Yeah, I would I would echo that as well. And and I think it probably is worth looking back at 2023, identifying maybe some of the ways that Tim Kelly found success with Will Levis. I felt like there was a lot of stuff that Man, they did just kind of like heave it to the to the first throw uh, or to the first read, and that first read was DeAndre Hopkins, and DeAndre Hopkins was comfortable out there. You know, when he was fully healthy, he was making some really good catches, and uh, he he was Will Levis's best friend. So I don't know if there's something there. There's a parallel they can draw within the two offenses to try and maybe bridge the gap, so to speak, get back to that. That's something that I think I would be reviewing and doing myself and and just finding those plays that are that are similar across the the two units. Um, looking at some of the stuff that I, I you know I, I don't know, it's hard to say because I, I ultimately come back to the example that Nick Holtz gave on the second play of the game where I, I don't know what will Levis saw pre-snap to. Uh, coax him out of the throw to Calvin Ridley, but it looked one-on-one -on -one slant on the backside. Ridley was open. I don't know that it would have been like a touchdown, but it would have been a chunk gain. And uh, Nick Holtz confirmed that that's where the ball was supposed to go. And Will Levis saw something prior to the snap, like basically just made up his mind. I'm going to throw the, the bubble screen to the right. And he does that and it's, it's blown up. And you can see on the tape that Ridley would have been open for a big game. So I just, I, I, I think of solutions, things that they could do differently, and then I just ultimately come back to it it doesn't matter if he's not hitting the throws. And I think that's the big concern for me is like how do you how do you account for that in real time? Because at this point, it kind of feels like the sand's running out of the hourglass. So how do you how do you get him to a point where those things from the neck up and the recognition standpoint and the decision making standpoint, how do you leverage what he's good at and fit it within the confines of this offense? And I, I feel like it's a really, it's going to be a really difficult thing for this coaching staff to do. Yeah, I, I do agree with you there, especially on the point where you said they're just not connecting. He's not hitting on a lot of things. The perfect example is the one that he needs to hit on the most. Calvin Ridley, his connection there has yeah. been unacceptable, for lack of a better term there, um, to be frank as well. It's just been absolutely unacceptable for a guy that you're paying, you know, $50 million over the next two years there. And so when you look at what he's been able to do with Calvin Ridley, Calvin Ridley has been targeted 26 times this season and only nine catches for 101. 141 yards and one touchdown of Ridley's 27 targets. Only 11 of them were considered catchable throws. That's 40.7% yeah. of Levis's throws to Ridley that were deemed catchable. And I think that that's, that comes from at Titan stats um, Wes over on X um, that, that, that is the one that, that really needs to change there and that they need to hit on. And I think there is another aspect of this, of this game that I think of Will Levis's game, I should say that, we, we've kind of glossed over for a couple weeks because the coaching staff was seemingly dismissing it. And then all of a sudden yesterday, Nick Holtz comes back to us and says, we've just not been a disciplined offensive unit when it comes to 
getting the personnel we need on and off the field and snapping the ball at the line of scrimmage before the clock runs out. And that was something that I thought was very surprising from a team who kind of tried to gaslight us into thinking that that was not the case over the last two or three weeks. And so when we asked Nick Holtz about this yesterday, he gave us this really interesting answer, kind of confirming our suspicions here with how they have not been able to operate well before the snap. Here's what he had to say. We substitute a lot, so now we're slow with the subs. So that just everything keeps getting all those little things compound. You know, you're two or three seconds late coming back to the huddle. Then we're starting to sub personnel. Then we're getting the right guys in. So there's two or three seconds there. Then we're kind of we don't really break the huddle with as much urgency as we'd like. You know, you see teams, especially in the start of training camp and things like that, really emphasizing that. So we got back to emphasizing that this week. Um, we really we're subbing from the sideline in practice just to. Uh, simulate that so all those two seconds here three seconds here two seconds here also if we had seven more seconds for everybody i think we'd feel a lot better so if we had seven more seconds before each play we'd feel a whole lot better that's the solution just that's petition the, solution. the nfl I, I i do like that we need with Roger Goodell, the Titans need seven yeah. more seconds before every play, and then Will Levis will be a good quarterback. Write your, write your congressman, folks. There you go. Right? Yes. We, we're getting close. I think that's on the ballot. Vote <laughs> yes on issue 11. Get the Titans <laughs> seven more seconds on every play. Um, I, I do think that that is an interesting answer. One, it gives me not the most confidence in the world that Will Levis can operate the offense while he's on the field. And two, it certainly seems like the, this new coaching staff that they've kind of melded together over the last off season is struggling to kind of get that um, in, in, into the players heads and kind of coach that up. And so from both perspectives, I think they can do a lot better and that's going to obviously have to happen against this Buffalo bills team this week. All right. A couple of questions here in, in the comment section before we move on. CWCW saying, I've been noticing that whole season the clock is down close to zero at every snap. I think that yeah. it is worth mentioning because if Will is getting that close to the, 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 uh, the end of the clock at the snap, he doesn't have that much time to kind of read the defensive look that um, he is he is showing everybody else. And I think that's been a real problem. And so if you are able to kind of execute your, your pre-snap clock management a lot better, what does that do for Will Levis in terms of him being able to decipher the offense? I, I do not know. That's going to be have to have to uh, kind of prove that to us over the next couple of weeks. CW also following up saying he had no issue last season. Callahan, I think his offense is overcomplicated, needlessly burrow with Bengals start slow also or start season slow also. Um, I do think that it's, at this point, I think the for better or for worse, I think the Titans have the offense down pretty well. I would probably agree with you over the first three weeks. It looks it looked a little bit more discombobulated than it is now. It still isn't good, but I think it looks a little bit more together now than it did yeah. over the first three weeks for what it's worth. So, But uh, you are right in the aspect that just like in Cincinnati, this is a complicated offense that uses a lot of moving parts and a lot, I mean, they ran motion on like 75% of their snap yeah. last week or something. Like it was crazy. Um, well, I remember. I, go well, ahead. Finish your thoughts. I, I was going to say, I remember uh former host of the show, my, my buddy Easton freeze telling me uh, during that game, he's like, maybe the Titans did listen to me during, during the, uh, during the week of the press conference, because I asked Nick Holt directly, why aren't you guys using more motion? And then they use motion on like 75% of the plays. And I, and he was like, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you're just, now, it didn't really work that much better, so maybe that was all on Easton, but I don't know. It could be. I, I don't know. We're going to look up in a couple of weeks, and Easton's going to be posting his goodbyes from A to Z Sports. He's <laughs> going to be hired by the Titans and just suddenly. Then we'll know, yes, they are listening to to Easton. Uh, I, I think I've mentioned it before on the, the Hot Read podcast, but I took on a little passion project as a way to – attempt to learn more about the intricacies of this offense. I wanted to chart every single play uh, of the season. And I've got like a notebook where I'm literally X's and O's on paper charting out um, the design of the play, what the defensive look is and where the ball eventually goes. And I, I've spent, I've legitimately spent 
an hour and a half charting the first three plays of the season. So I've kind of started to realize that might have to be an off-season project. I don't think I'm going to get much of that done. But just in watching that, um, you can see like the different personnel groupings, the motions, the different ways, directions that the ball can go on any given play. It's like, I don't know, man. I didn't notice. I, I think I'm like 12 plays into the season on this point, and I just I didn't notice any recurring theme of this clearly looks like there's one spot for the ball designed to go to. It looks like any play, it, it just can go anywhere at any time in any direction, and it's kind of – it's difficult to kind of get a deeper grasp on other than just watching the tape and seeing how things play out. It's really difficult to look at a play as it's charted in this offense and and say what could have been, if not what actually happened, if that makes sense. And I think that's, you know, it, it's certainly something that can have my head swimming. So I, I can certainly understand that even at a deeper level, um, it's it's kind of hard to pick up on all the moving parts in this thing. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there in the certain aspect that they continue to tell us about how much of a progression-based offense is that this yeah. is. And if Will Levis cannot progress through those reads and we see how much his first look, his first read throw rate is, that that's where you're starting to see the problem. And so to bring us full circle, that's why Mason Rudolph ends up starting this game this week because they want to see this progression-based offense progress more than the first read. And so I, I I do think that if you do end up seeing Mason Rudolph out there, it's more in line with the fact that it may be good for Will Levis to take kind of a 10,000 foot view of this, this, this offense and how it's being ran to give him the ability to develop later on. And so that's that on the quarterback discussion before we move on, have to give a huge shout out to our sponsor of the podcast, Sinkers Beverages in the East Nashville area. They've been serving that area for over 40 years in uh, East Nashville. Like I said earlier, they were a three-time Best of Nashville liquor store of the year. Well, yesterday, the Nashville scene Best of Nashville came out and Sinkers they they got the they got the four. They got four rings now, almost enough for an entire hand to have a ring on there. There's a reason why they won yet again, and it's because they have simply the best selection of beers, spirits, wines, anything that you possibly need. Even THC drinks. I know they probably have one of the biggest selection of THC infused drinks in uh out of any store here in the greater Nashville area. Got to follow them on all their social medias at Sinkers Bev on Twitter, on Instagram, and join their in crowd to get special benefits, allocations, and private tastings that you can only know about if you sign up for the in crowd. If you can't make it out there, no worries because they got you on Uber Eats. Simply search Sinkers on Uber Eats. And guess what, Stoney? They drive so you can what? drink and you you drink so they can what drive there you go i tried to throw you a curveball there on that last one i saw it took you a little a second or two more but um <laughs> they do they do offer everything on uber eats so go uh get some of that booze delivered to you remember to drink responsibly have to give a special shout out as well to their sister store bluegrass beverages that have been serving the local hendersonville area for over 50 years Thank you once again to Sinkers Beverages and Bluegrass Beverages. All right, Stoney, now on to whatever this game is going to be this Sunday. If the Titans go to Highmark Stadium as nine and a half point underdogs against the Buffalo Bills team who, you know, kind of escaped New York with a win against those Jets last week. It was a hard fought battle for them, but they do stop the skid there, get their, uh, get their win there against the Jets, and now they have a what seems to be an easy opponent in the Tennessee Titans coming up to bat now this week. However, if we know anything about the Titans, it's that they they lose games they they, they should win, and they win games they shouldn't. And I, I, I'm not projecting this to be one of those games where they're in it and they upset the Bills, but anything is possible. And if they want to make that possibility a reality... They have to stop Josh Allen this week. I mean, I don't know about you, Stoney, but in my opinion, this is the 
most dynamic quarterback and passer they've played yet this season. Mm-hmm. You've seen kind of you've seen the running game uh, from like a Malik Willis, um, but not really the passing metrics from from that quarterback. You've seen the passing ability of an Aaron Rodgers, but not the running. Well, this week you got you're going up against the full package in Josh Allen, who can simply many times beat you on his own. Um, and, and I think that's going to be the biggest thing for the Titans. Uh, this week is to stop Josh Allen. And we asked Denard Wilson this week about stopping that dynamic quarterback. Here's what he had to say. You know, he he is his own check down and he can extend plays and let it loose. So you have to be able to plaster in the back end. You have to play into the echo and whistle. Um, you know, Josh can throw that, that ball a mile if he gets outside of the pocket. So we got to stay connected. We got to stay disciplined and we got to allow the guys up front to do what they do. And so I do think that with the uh, with the Titans going up there, it's going to be a definite challenge for this Titans defense, one that is going to be without potentially Legereus need this week. And so, Stoney, I ask you if there was one group or specifically player that needs to step up this week that can get the best of Josh Allen, which group or players in particular need to get after the quarterback this week? Man, I I think it really has to be Arden Key and Harold Landry off the edge. I think they have to set those edges hard. I think they have to tackle him when they have their sights set on him, and they do have to contain him in the pocket. I think it's a it's a really interesting evolution of this Bills offense. We're used to the deep shots to Stephon Diggs and and Gabe Davis and and that sort of thing, but that's really not what this Buffalo offense has been this season. It's been a lot more dink and dunk a a death by a million paper cuts to guys like Khalil Shakir getting the ball into Curtis Samuel's hands letting him run Uh, Dalton Kincaid is a matchup problem at tight end where we've seen the big plays come from from this Buffalo offense so far is when Josh Allen gets outside of the pocket and Denard Wilson said it perfectly this guy's arm is so talented that it's just effortless he just heaves the ball 40 yards down the field mid stride while he's running outside and it it creates conflict for the linebackers in space for the defensive ends trying to to bring him down because he is a threat to just take the ball and run he's got great wiggle as runner in the open field he's a pretty nifty guy but he's also just really big and tough to bring down and that is a a hard decision that guys have to process and make in real time is he going to throw the ball or is he going to tuck it and run and that's where we've seen the big plays come from in this buffalo offense so if they if they can keep him in the pocket and kind of muddy things up for him maybe they can buy themselves a little bit of time i i think jeffrey simmons and the run defense is going to be a, a major factor in in doing that as well for all of the praise that Ray Davis got for Monday night's performance against the Jets, he had wide open holes to throw, uh, to run through. The offensive line did a fantastic job. So I do think this will be a big Jeff Simmons, Devon, Devondre Sweat, hold the middle, and then Arden Key and Harold Landry just have to get to the edge to keep him inside and don't let him get out of the pocket and start uh, start running around and heaving the ball 40 yards down the field. Another thing to think about, too, is that when he does get outside the pocket, he's essentially extending the play, requiring the cornerbacks downfield to cover longer. And we know... It's a proven metric in the NFL. The longer a cornerback has to cover a guy, the more likely it is they're eventually going to slip up and the guy's going to get open. So that's another layer to this thing that is a recipe for disaster if the Titans, if they don't just keep Josh Allen in the pocket. Yeah, and normally I would say any other week that this Bills team, you know, has some talented guys. You you talk about stopping the run game. I think they are in line to get James Cook back this week, who has been a dynamic play Uh, maker for them both in the run game and also in the receiving game he's the guy they're gonna have to watch but then also their tight ends Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid uh, I think could spell disaster for the interior linebackers if they cannot keep them in check this week especially when you talk about extending the play there there's nobody better for this team uh, like Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid who are able to just kind of slip past defenders 
uh, as the play develops to get open for Josh Allen when he extends it there. I think that's going to be a big matchup there. And you notice how I don't really talk about many of the wide receivers. It's because I didn't think that they were going to have much of a dominant number one wide receiver threat until two days ago when the Buffalo Bills traded for Amari Cooper from the Cleveland Browns. And reports came out early today that Amari Cooper is in line to play for the Bills this weekend against the Titans. I want to ask two questions here. One, how big of a threat do you think Amari Cooper is against these cornerbacks this week? And two, how much do you think the how much usage, I guess, would you see from him? Do you think that this is a scenario where he is a legitimate threat this week against the Titans? Or do you think they kind of more roll him out in a way to kind of, you know, demand attention, but much like the Titans were a little bit using DeAndre Hopkins for in the, in the early parts of the season, he's not that much of a threat out there because of how new he is. Yeah, I think he could potentially be a deep threat option for this offense in the sense that, you know, you have certain routes that guys run at, at a way of, you know, it's a, it's a called play that they're just going to run deep and the quarterback's going to throw to a spot. That sort of deal, which we've heard talked about this week because of Aaron Rodgers basically throwing Mike Williams under the bus from the Monday night game. But I do think that's a that's an easy transition here, like man situations where they just put him out there and say, okay, uh, here you go. Here's your man. We're going to throw it deep. I, I wouldn't expect him to really get a heavy workload on Sunday. Uh, I, I just don't know if he's going to be able to ramp up that quickly with a, a new playbook, but, and, and, you know, we haven't even talked about the, the chemistry issue with Josh Allen, like getting used to him. I wouldn't be surprised if they took a couple of shots to him and those design plays um, in man situations, but I, I don't know. I think they're going to play by and large the same way that they've been playing. Uh, Cooper is a seasoned pro. So like I said, I would expect him to ramp up pretty quickly. I just don't know a few days quickly is enough for it. Yeah, I think that is definitely fair. But you talk about those deep shots that they may end up taking to him. Um, and one thing that the Titans have defended well kind of is the deep shot and that has to do yeah. a lot with Legereus need maybe not being the best <laughs> at, at defending it right now it's just more of a more of the titans or the, the titans opponents not um being able to keep or get the ball there so to say when you look at Tyler Huntley with Tyreek Hill and Joe Flacco last week against Alec Pierce like they were able to get outside of Legereus need and, and make the play it's just they weren't able to connect if there were two yeah. guys this week who are going to be able to do the same thing to you it is amari cooper and josh allen who i have no doubts about putting the ball where it needs to be at all times um i do think that sneed if he does play will do some good for a bounce back game uh, we asked denard wilson kind of as we've been asking everybody this week that you know we, we kind of graded Snead this past week as it was a pretty poor performance in his by his estimations as well by also what we've seen from him in the past and we asked Denard Wilson about uh Legereus Snead this week here's what he had to say yesterday a bad day. And no matter what you do in life no matter what you do in your profession is how you get up so you know this week is don't make the mistakes that you that you made last week um clean up the details finish every play and he'll be just fine. I mean, he's still a hell of a corner. I believe in him. This organization believes in him. And just like any anything you do in life, there's going to be ups and downs. There'll be a bad day. And he, had, he left some plays on the, on the table last week, but I'm confident he'll make them this week. We saw it last week. That's the biggest point, I think, there, that he did leave some on the table there that simply they did not were not able to maybe connect on or Michael Pittman out jumps him for that ball there in the end zone. But those are plays that if you're getting paid like you are to be one of the best corners in the league, you simply have to make. And so I do think for what it's worth, the uh, the Titans are going to have to rely on Snead if he's out there to be the corner that we've seen him be in the past with other teams. Uh, one more comment here from Amani Hooker on being able to execute in this offense. Obviously the Titans, defense has been able to execute for the most part as in they are allowing the least amount of yards per game of any team in the league so far however the offense still is not executing but the way that this defense continues to talk I think is pretty interesting here's what Amani Hooker had to say 
We gotta win games. At the end of the day, it's not just about one side of the ball doing, <clears throat> doing their job. It's about how can we do our job even better to help out the whole team. So that's why that's getting off the field. Um, I mean, they don't, we, they don't have to score points. So we can just let teams not score points and we'll probably win the game. Yeah, I think that this is a defense that has pretty much been predicated on bending and not breaking, and they've done a decent part, a decent job of doing that. However, they haven't been able to do it when uh, it it comes up, when when it matters the most, right? This is a defense that's holding teams to the least amount of yards in the league. However, a lot of those yards are coming towards the end of games where they just simply aren't able to execute like they have the rest of the game, and that's where they're they're losing and. No, that answer was a little uh, little jumbled there because of Chica Conquo and Josh Wiley having a battle for the ages on the ping pong table, which, by the way, if Chig gave us his his uh, personal permission to film that game yesterday. However, Titans PR will not let us uh, oh, film ping pong on. games. So if you want to also write to your fellow congressmen and tweet at Titans to let them Film ping pong games, I guess you can go do that. But Amani Hooker, nonetheless, th this team has maybe executed in some ways and have not in others. And I think Chef uh, brings up a great point, which gets to the bottom of it. They have to make the big plays when it matters most, also turnovers. And I think it's an interesting matchup this week. Josh Allen, who has not thrown an interception yet, versus a defense that only has one interception to their name through six weeks. And I think that yeah. may tell the tale of the tape when it gets down to it. Yeah, first of all, uh, Amani Hooker, teammate of the year right there, just, you know, standing up there and basically saying, like, we can't allow a single point on defense. <laughs> On defense, we have to be better. They are doing better. They are a good unit. And you're right. It, it is later in these games that we're kind of seeing the, the big plays allowed, the yardage accumulate and that sort of thing. And man, I go back to the psyche of the team and I just, I, I can't help just from a human psychology standpoint, wonder how much of that is from pressure building because of the offensive output. And the defense kind of knowing we've got to be perfect. I feel like when you try to do things perfectly, that's when you set yourself up for disappointment because you're never going to be perfect. So I, I just can't help but wonder if this is another sort of side effect of the poor offensive output. Yeah, I, I, I think that it definitely can. And it's something that probably will potentially wear on this defense as they go up against two yeah, of the most yeah. prolific offenses that they're going to see all year in the next two weeks. And if they somehow get routed in this game and then absolutely dominated in the next game against the Lions, because the Lions have been doing that to a lot of their opponents this year, what does the locker room look like after that game, I wonder? And so that's something I think we'll it's have a to fair pay question. attention to. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's going to do it for our preview there as we can move on to uh, one of my favorite segments, maybe not the most profitable segment this year, but I do still love doing it. It's the best bet gauntlet for week seven. Stoney, you continue to truck on, truck along with a pretty uh, respectable record so far into the season here, whereas I, look, I'm just going to chalk it up to maybe a bad month. You know, we, we bounce back from these. How, 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 many, how many different ways can I try to you know, console myself every week when I do this. I don't know because I continue to f kind of lose my mind with, uh, with how these have gone. And look, I mean, was I expecting a, uh, statistical anomaly week last week? No, but did it happen? Yes. Uh, road favorites finished nine and oh, straight up against the spread in week six and all against the spread over the last two weeks. Uh, it would be the most covers in a single week without an eight against the spread loss by road favorite since the merger in 1970. Just a crazy week and goes against mm -hmm. all logic and, and uh, historical data. But nonetheless, we bet through it, like you said. And that's going to start with this week's best bet gauntlet. And so with my first pick this week, I am going with Seattle plus three going to the Atlanta Falcons. And look, I, I think I was pretty right on, on where Seattle was coming into their San Francisco game on Thursday night. They were on short rest against a better opponent. They got handled 
like I thought they would. And now Mike McDonald has some more time on extended rest here to get his guys ready for this matchup against the team that I think is pretty evenly matched. These are two prolific offenses who have been working well so far this season. But as the the Seahawks get more of their defensive tackles back, I think they're going to be able to bring a lot more pressure than they were against the San Francisco 49ers. I know um, they won't have, uh, I believe... um, Who's their Who's their best cornerback? I forget. He was I, his name is escaping me. I, I want to say Quandre Diggs. No, the other one, um, Reek Woolen. Reek Woolen. I don't know why I was thinking of um, Diggs, but Reek Woolen does maybe does not play this week. It's looking like he won't. But I still like the defense that uh, Mike McDonald's able to br- bring out there, and I think this is going to be a lot closer of a game than uh, those three points. And you know, for for what it's worth. Atlanta just loves to choke at home anyways. And I see this game coming down to the, to the uh, wire here. So I'm going to take Seattle plus three with my first pick this week. I'm going to go with the Colts uh, minus three favorites against the Miami Dolphins. I don't think the Dolphins are very good. And I think the the Colts are a little undervalued. I think they're, they're in the wild card race for, for better, for worse, whatever that means in the AFC this year, where it's like there's four good teams and then everybody else. But I, I do think that with Joe Flacco at quarterback, and uh, I still haven't seen whether that's a, an actual official ruling or not, but I mean, I kind of feel like this team has to go with Joe Flacco at this point if they're going to be chasing chasing a wild card berth. But I do think uh, they're a really efficient offense. I think they'll be able to run the ball on this Dolphins defense, and I, I like them to, uh, to win this game. I think they're a little undervalued here. I, I think it's a 24-20 type of situation. I'm not saying that the Colts are going to dominate, but I do think that they, um, they could win this one by up to a touchdown. So I'm, I'm going with Indy on this one. I like it. I like it. With my next pick here, I'm going with the Jets as one and a half point favorites against the Pittsburgh Steelers this week. And I think it has to do a lot with the uh, the... Jets being on the more desperate team. Look, this is a Jets team that has been reeling of late, but I do think they get some mojo back with adding Devontae Adams, where that's a little different. Obviously, uh, it, it seems like Devontae Adams is going back to his his uh, former lover in Aaron Rodgers, and the, the chemistry looks like it may just be able to... Uh, ignite right as they step on the field together and so I don't think that's much of an issue but I do also think that this game is trending to the point where we are going to see the Steelers roll out Russell Wilson and I do think that that's a downgrade for right now especially maybe not in the long run but especially going up against this Jets team who has had a pretty dominant secondary this year uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to back the team that that kind of has it more together right now and is a little bit more desperate to get this win. Rodgers has also been very good against Mike Tomlin in his career. He's 2-1 and one straight up and 3-0 and oh against the spread all time when he was with the Packers. Now he's with the Jets, but um, he has found success in these games. I do like the Jets to get a win here. It, it's probably a much-needed win to stay alive in that aforementioned AFC playoff race that who knows what's going to happen, but I'm going to take the Jets minus one and a half. I'm going to go to one of the biggest games, if not the biggest game of the week for my next pick. I'm looking at the Lions at the Vikings. That point total is sitting right there at 50 and a half. I'm going to take the under. I could see the outcome of this game going either way, but this is a big matchup featuring two of the better defenses in football. I think Minnesota, if you haven't watched them yet, it's a master class on defense right now. I, I think they're favored by one and a half in this game, but I, I'm not touching that number because I really could see this going either way. But I'm taking the under. It's a big matchup. It's a divisional game between two defenses. I think this is going to be kind of a, a a stalemate situation in the first quarter before things loosen up. And I just don't think that Either of these teams, despite what we've seen recently, are going to be able to score quickly enough to hit the over in this one. The stakes are high. You're talking about a potential one seed in the NFC down the stretch. I think this game has big game feel, and I'm I'm taking the under in this one with the pressure, pressure-filled defensive performance from both of these teams. Yeah, I think even without Aiden Hutchinson, that defense still will find a way to get after the quarterback. Um, I I like that one as well. I think you definitely could see both teams try to be a little more perfect than they usually are, and that'll lead to them 
um, not being able to sling the ball as much. Um, that's going to be the big thing, fundamentals in that game. With my third pick here in the best bet gauntlet, I'm taking the New York Giants plus three and a half as home underdogs against the Philadelphia Eagles. This is another fade of a team that seems to have some inner inner issues with both their coach and just how their locker room seems to operate right now. Um, you look at Jalen Hurts uh, over the last couple of weeks. He is 1-5-1 and one against the spread in his last six starts in a spot like this. Uh, in his career, Jalen Hurts is 7-15-1 against the spread as a favorite away from home. In the last 20 years, he's the fourth least profitable quarterback as a favorite away from home. This is another divisional home dog bet here for the Giants. Um, Kenneth, he he keeps coming into these these uh, these chats here, and he always seems to get the best of me. But I, I even though it is a Saquon revenge game, I don't you think the Giants also know that? I think it goes more than uh, just the Eagles' way when considering that they're also out Jordan Mailata, and a lot of this offensive line is a little shaken up there. This you know, for, for what it's worth, the New York Giants defense seems to be clicking a lot better than it was. And I, I, I begrudgingly say that Daniel Jones has looked good over the past couple of weeks, especially um, with how they even how they played last week against the, the Bengals. And I know you told me to bet the Bengals, but uh, that's in the past. But the way they're running the ball right now, I think it can match the output of this Eagles team. And so I expect this to be closer than the number here. So I'm going to take the giants plus three and a half. I'm going to go out to San Francisco where the 49ers host the Kansas city chiefs. I'm going to take that over at 47 and a half, even though I got burned by a point total at 47 and a half last week when Packers Cardinals finished yeah. at exactly 47 points. I'm not I'm not scared. I'm not superstitious. All that stuff is just hocus pocus. It ain't real. I'm going back to this 47 and a half point number and I'm going to take the the over. I don't think either of these defenses have necessarily been what we thought they were going to be and I think these are two two offenses that can go out there and they're they're getting into a rhythm. I think they're going to put on a show in San Francisco. Give me the over 47 and a half Chiefs at 49ers. My next pick here in my fourth overall, I'm taking Cleveland plus six and a half. I'm going back to Cleveland because as gross as it is, this is another spot where you have to back the home divisional dog, especially when it comes to the AFC North, who have been um, the best of any division when it comes to against the spread betting. Um, the underdogs in the AFC North since 2018 are 45 and 30 against the spread. That's good for 60%, um, especially when you consider they're going up against a team that seemingly always has Joe Burrow's number no matter what. We've seen it time and time again now. He is 1-5 and five straight up against the Browns. He is 0-3 oh straight up on the road against the Browns. This is, like I said last week, is a defense that still finds a way to, to beat you up. And uh, considering that with the injuries the, the Bengals have on their offensive line, I feel like Miles Garrett is going to be able to get after that quarterback. And I think it's going to be a struggle for this team. Also fits in to the model that underdogs of six points or more over the season have been insanely successful. They went one and one last week, but I believe that number is now up to 17, uh, three and one on the season. Still very profitable if you want to take the big underdogs this week. And that's why I'm taking Cleveland in this spot, plus six and a half. Even without Amari Cooper, I think they find a way with Nick Chubb back with their running game to to kind of do just enough to keep it inside this number, even if they do not win here. So um, I'm going to take Cleveland. Well, let's keep the disgusting bets going because I'm going to go to another sicko team, and that's the New England Patriots, five-and-a-half-point underdogs in London against the Jaguars. Drake May, not the best situational awareness when uh, asked why fans in England should root for the Patriots. He said, well, it's called New England. You gotta might want to learn your history there, bud. Might, might want to learn your history there a little bit. I don't know how well that's going to go over in London, but for whatever reason – I'm not the biggest Drake May guy, but it, his addition into that offense seemed to provide a bit of a spark. It didn't help him much last week against the Houston Texans, who hung 41. On, Talk about a defense that was supposed to be very, very good. They, yeah, they just did not show up whatsoever. Yeah. But I think they, I think they get right against a much worse Jacksonville team, and Drake May hits enough plays to keep this game close. I don't like the Jags at all. I, I think. 
they're among the worst teams in football. That's not a, a reach to say at all. I think the Patriots, because of their defense, maybe getting up because of the the change at quarterback, I think they can keep this one a little tighter than five points. So I'm I'm going to take the Patriots in this spot. And with my final pick of the best bet gauntlet this week, I shivers to make me say this, but I'm going to take Tennessee plus nine and a half in this spot. Once again, going with that model that teams in this spot have just been able to cover that number. And look, I, I think this is also a spot where Buffalo, for what it's worth, may play down to their competition, even though we've Allen up a whole heck of a lot in this show. There's also ways where he's seemingly disappointed in these games. Um, Allen has closed as a four point favorite or more 27 times over the last three full seasons. And the bills are nine 17 and one against the spread in those games of 46 quarterbacks to close over four points in any game during that span. Allen's nine 17 and one against the spread mark is the worst. Like we said, I think this defense continues to be one of the best units in the league. And if Legereus Sneed plays out there, he's had Josh Allen's number from time to time here over the last couple of years. This is, he's no stranger to what Josh Allen can do. And I think he brings some of that to this team, whether it is Will Levis or Mason Rudolph, you know, I, would I feel maybe more secure in this number if it ends up being Mason Rudolph? Probably. I, I feel really good about that number <laughs> if it is Mason Rudolph. But still, I think that with um, with with whatever the Titans roll out there this week, I think they keep it closer than uh, than the nine and a half. So I'm going to take them with my last pick. I'm going to go with the uh, Ravens by three and a half against Tampa Bay for my final pick. I just like the way this offensive line has come together. They're really starting to gel. Baltimore starting to run the ball. I think it comes down to plays made from the quarterback position. I, I'm a big Baker Mayfield fan. I'm happy to see him having a career renaissance in Tampa Bay but he's not Lamar Jackson. And I think Lamar Jackson getting in space, running the ball in space, the Bucs have a good defensive line. I'm not saying that the Ravens are going to run it down their throat, but I think the Ravens are going to be able to get the ball to guys that can make plays in space, including Jackson himself. And I think this is a touchdown victory, like a 27-20 type of victory for the uh, the Baltimore Ravens. So I'm, I'm back in Derrick Henry in that purple and black uniform. All righty, and so those are the picks this week. To recap here, I'm taking Seattle plus three, Jets minus one and a half, New York Giants, both New York teams, I guess, this week, plus three and a half, Cleveland plus six and a half, and Tennessee plus nine and a half. That is four underdogs and one favorite, even though the favorites uh, finished nine and zero last week on the road. I'm still taking them about that. Uh, I'm still taking the underdogs. Got to stick to my priors here. And then Stoney, you are taking the Colts minus three, the, uh, the Ravens minus three and a half, the Patriots plus five and a half. And then looking at some totals here, you're going under 50 and a half in the Vikings lions game. And then the over 47 and a half in the Kansas city chiefs and 49ers game. And that's going to do it here for the Hot Read Podcast on this Friday. Hope you enjoyed this episode and enjoy this Tennessee Titans game this weekend. Remember, Sinker's Beverages, if you're looking for a place to cure your happiness or your sorrows or anything that happens this week with the Titans, remember Sinker's Beverages. Search them on Uber Eats because they drive so you can drink. And until Tuesday, this has been the Hot Read Podcast. We will talk to you then. Thank you.